We had a wonderful Vespers last night where people were sharing their testimonies about how God was with them day by day. It was a beautiful time together, and I went home feeling uplifted and encouraged, and then I entered into uh, a little misadventure last night when I got home. Some of you may know that I live with a small Australian shepherd by the name of Tucker. I went home last night and I was taking Tucker out to the back to go to the bathroom before going to bed. And I opened my front door and I was walking through the side of the house. There's like a little um, covered shed area that leads to the backyard. I opened up the front gate to it and Tucker usually waits for me to go through, but this time he shot off like a rocket into this covered area. And I was thinking to myself, oh, he must really need the bathroom. But no, he went straight to the back and I heard a big noise and I started chasing after him and I stopped like I hit a wall. It wasn't an actual physical wall, but it was a wall of smell. Because my dog had encountered a skunk. If you are new to this country, You might have come from a place like I did that does not have skunks. I do not know why the Lord created skunks. We will have to ask him in heaven. But my dog uh, encountered a skunk. And if you have ever had uh, an animal encounter a skunk, or if you yourself have encountered a skunk, they are well known for what? Stinking. So, I hear a noise, Tucker runs back towards me, and with him comes the wafts of a skunk smell. It's 9.30 last night, I open the door uh, into my front yard, the dog goes crazy, rolling around all of my plants, (laughs) trying to get the smell off of him. Um, So he's crushed all of the flowers in the front and all of the uh, plants, but the poor dog, he wanted the smell to get off of him. I actually didn't know how to get the smell of skunk off of dog. Um, Apparently, you're not supposed to wet the dog. I found that out later. (laughs) So I, I let him roll around, I grabbed my hose. I did know not to bring him into the house with the smell of skunk, because I grabbed the hose, I tried to wet him down. Um, I, I grabbed the shampoo. I do have some dog shampoo. I shampooed him. I, I hosed him down again. He still smells of skunk. Not as bad, but we, we went for some long walks around the neighborhood last night, and uh, I did some more shampooing, and he was in his crate <laughs> sleeping last night because I didn't want him to, to roll over everything. This morning... I greeted Tucker, and he smells of skunk. So friends, I wanted to mention this to you for two reasons. The first is, if I smell slightly off when you greet me in the back, I apologize. There might be some skunk odors clinging to me still too. But the second reason that I share this story with you is because uh, this week I have been reading through the book of Ruth, a story that starts off with tragedy. And as I was contemplating this book and as this situation happened last night, I began to wonder a little bit about how tragedy can sometimes feel like an encounter with a skunk. 
It happens suddenly and its after effects last for a long time and your natural instinct at first is to try and get away from the situation as quickly as possible or to, to push it away from you but it follows you and so then, then the inclination can come to distance yourself from everyone and everything, to isolate yourself. Or if you feel like others can sense it and you don't want them to have to to experience what you've experienced, what once was a sweet smelling life has turned ugly or foul, like a bad smell that lingers sometimes. I thought of this, as I mentioned, when reading through the book of Ruth. And we're going to be reading this book over these next two weeks as part of our Practicing Faith series. So I'm going to invite you to grab your Bibles with me. If this is your first time here, there should be some Bibles in front of you. Um, if you've been here for a long time, you know that I love to read big passages of Scripture together. I think that that is the power. It is in Scripture. So turn with me to Ruth chapter 1, either on your phones, in your Bibles, or you can follow along on the screen. We'll be reading here together. And as you turn to Ruth chapter 1, just as a little bit of a background of the story, Ruth comes right after the book of Judges. And at the very end of the book of Judges, you'll find Israel society splintering and disintegrating. The stories at the end of the book of Judges are some of the most horrifying stories. And the final verses of Judges ends with the words, in those days Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. And you see a society crumbling. And then, though, in the midst of that time when people were doing what they saw fit and they were turning on each other and they were making all sorts of horrible decisions, you have this story of Ruth and Naomi. So let us read. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malan and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Such short words for such tragedy. First, there is famine in the land. And a family has to leave to make the difficult decision between leaving everything they know or possibly starving. And so they decide to leave and go to Moab. It's an important detail where they end up in Moab, but we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit more next week. They go seeking a better life, but tragedy strikes. First, Elimelech dies. One little sentence for the death of a spouse. But Naomi still tries to make a new life for herself with her sons. They settle, they marry, and it reads, then her two sons die. Simple words, but encapsulating so much tragedy and loss. I have talked a little bit and read a little bit with those who have lost a spouse, and they've described it as a multifaceted grief. It's loss of companionship, loss of memories, lots of stories, loss of smiles, lots of moments. But it's also the loss of some very practical, tangible support and help. Whatever area of responsibility your spouse had, you have lost that now. If your spouse did the car payments or the credit cards or the grocery shopping or the cooking, they are no longer there. There's a story that I read recently about a widow called Marilyn who went to a grocery run 
with some other seniors. It was one of the first times she went to the grocery store since her husband had died a few months before. And things were going fine until she arrived at the checkout line and she needed to pay. And so she gave her credit card to the cashier and the cashier rung it and said, your credit card has been declined. And she finds out that her credit card had been canceled because it had been in her husband's name. She didn't realize it. And so she's standing there with all of her food, with no money. And uh, this particular story was shared because what happened next was the person behind her said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And the hundred plus dollar bill was taken care of by the man beside her. She tried to get his name, the story says, but he said, no, just say a prayer for me and then disappears. It is a beautiful moment of somebody supporting somebody else when they find themselves in a situation they never expected. But how many times does it happen where somebody is standing in that moment and somebody else doesn't step up? In ancient Israel, in fact, this sense of a lack of support or vulnerability was far, far worse than it even is today. If you were a widow in that time, you had no money, no support system, no guarantee of a stranger's kindness, no way to stay alive. It's like the odor of tragedy clinging to them. And we'll see Naomi do her best to isolate herself, to distance herself from those near her because she feels like she is cursed in some way. So let's continue the story and read on. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, if you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept out loud, and they said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. What difficult and tragic words. Naomi has become convinced that her lot is hopeless. That there is like a, a stench around her that will not be wiped out no matter how hard anyone tries. It is better not to try. It is better for others to go on with their lives and leave her alone, she says. Go. The Lord has turned his hand against me. And so one of her daughter-in-laws, Orpah, listens, and the other, Ruth, refuses to listen. We will unpack Ruth's part of the story a little bit more next week, but it is one of the most beautiful examples of this word chesed, this Hebrew word of faithfulness and willingness to stick by the other no matter what. And we'll look at that a little bit more in just a moment. But let's pick up the story in verse 19. After Ruth has said, no, I am going to stay with you, verse 19. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, can this be Naomi? She looks nothing like the person that we remembered. Has that ever happened to anyone that you've known? You see them 
And then a while later you see them again and you say, what happened? Could this be the same person? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, which means pleasant? Call me Mara, which means bitter. The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. As I was reading this, I was struck by possibly one of the saddest verses that I've read in a long time. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Is there anyone here who has felt like crying this cry? Anyone who's experienced or resonated with this verse at any point, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Maybe you wrestled with it. You didn't want to say it, but you felt, I once was full and now feel empty. Author Edgar Jackson describes grief like this. Grief is a young widow trying to raise her three children alone. Grief is the man so filled with shocked uncertainty and confusion that he strikes out at the nearest person. Grief is a mother walking daily to a nearby cemetery to stand quietly and alone a few minutes before going about the tasks of the day. She knows that a part of her is in that cemetery, just as a part of her is in her daily work. Grief is silent and knife-like terror and sadness that comes a hundred times a day when you start to speak to someone who's no longer there. Grief is the emptiness that comes when you eat alone after eating with someone else for so many years. Grief is teaching yourself to go to bed without saying good night to the one who has died. Grief is the helpless wishing that things were different when you know they are not and never will be again. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. It's interesting to me that so many sermons that I've heard on this beginning part of the book of Ruth focus on blaming Naomi at this point. Oh, Naomi, she is so bitter. She is, she has moved away from God's will by moving from, from Bethlehem to Moab. She's offered poor advice by, by telling Orpah and Ruth not to go with her because if they go with her, they might stay with her God. She is being insensitive to Ruth and Orpah. She's blind to Ruth's presence. Oh, Naomi, don't be like Naomi. And I can understand the point that's being made, but I honestly have a very hard time blaming Naomi in this story. She has lost so much. She is in such obvious pain and grief. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. No husband, no sons, no possession, no land, no future, no hope. Naomi could be forgiven for imagining that there was something like a stench, the smell of tragedy hanging around her. Her grief is palpable, her bitterness understandable, she wants to be alone because that is how she feels completely alone. But, but there are three things that Naomi has not yet grasped. Three things that we'll discover unpacking the story a little further. First, God has not turned God's back on her. God has not turned God's back on any one of us who may be saying these words. God has not forgotten her. God has not abandoned her. We can see seeds of hope in the last verse of this chapter. Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Simple words, as the barley harvest was beginning. It doesn't seem very important, does it? There's a harvest starting. 
Maybe it's just to mark the passage of time. This is when they came, the beginning of spring, generally. But if you remember some of the passages that we read last week, the barley harvest was beginning, reminds us of a couple of things. First, in the place where there was once famine, the seeds of something that have been planted before are just starting to ripen. There are seeds growing. Something is coming. Something is growing. It is not all barren. And from last week, we remember that God describes God's self as the Lord your God from Deuteronomy 10. The Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the stranger by giving them food and clothing. A little later in Deuteronomy, and it was read here in our offering call, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you're not to go back to get it. It shall belong to the stranger and the orphan and the widow in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. The barley harvest was beginning and God had already made provisions for her that she would not starve, that there would be enough for her. Number one, God had not forgotten her. The seeds of hope had already been planted, even if she didn't know it. Number two, she is not actually returning empty. She's accompanied by Ruth, right? She stands there saying to the, to the community that greets her, I have come back completely empty. I wonder what Ruth must have felt like standing next to her. Maybe a little wave. Hi, I'm Ruth. <laughs> She's empty, but I am, I am here. <laughs> she is not alone. Ruth is there with her. In fact, Ruth is herself a widow, grieving, faced with loss who has chosen the harder journey to walk with Naomi in her grief, to go where she goes, to live where she lives. This is one of the most beautiful passages that we see in scripture. We skipped over it because I wanted to go back and read it right now. Ruth chapter one, verse 16. After Naomi has said, go away and live your life. Mine is too hopeless. Ruth says, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. She forgot Naomi forgot maybe these words when she said, I have returned empty. But Ruth said, no, you have not. Where you go, I will go. I will walk with you. And in the words of Ruth, we hear the words of the Lord. I will be present with you. Beautiful words. There's a story in a book called Stories from the Journey about a European seminary professor by the name of Hans and his wife Enid. And in World War II, they left Europe and fled to America, and there they were teaching, he was teaching theology, and he was a warm and gentle teacher, beloved by his students. He's brought scripture to life with him. And the most beautiful thing was that he and his wife were very much in love. Nearly every day they took long walks together holding hands. They always sat close together in church until one tragic day that Enid died and it overwhelmed Hans with sorrow. Worried because he would not eat or walk, the seminary president along with three other friends visited him regularly, but he remained lonely and depressed. He was experiencing what's sometimes called the dark night of the soul. And Hans said to his friends, I am no longer able to pray to God. In fact, I am not certain I believe in God anymore. And in that moment, 
After a moment of silence, the seminary president said, then we will believe for you. We will make your confession for you. We will pray for you. So every day, week after week, month after month, the four men gathered and prayed together, asking God to draw close and restore the gift of faith to their dear friend. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, until there came a day as the four gathered around Hans that he smiled at them and said, it is no longer necessary for you to pray for me. Today, I want you to pray with me. During his dark night of the soul, instead of carrying Hans to Jesus on a stretcher like we see in the Gospels, these friends carried Hans to Jesus with their prayers. There might be those among us who need this, who have suffered a grief or a loss and are wrestling with their faith even. And they need somebody to stand next to them and say, I will pray for you until the day I can pray with you again. Naomi is not alone. And we are called to be like Ruth's for Naomi. So first, God has not forgotten her. Second, she is not in fact actually fully empty or alone. She has someone near her and third. Third, though I used the, the uh, lingering smell of a skunk as a metaphor in this story of Naomi, I want to be very clear here. And this is always the danger of using metaphors. I want to be clear that it is not in fact grief or loss or broken heartedness that smells bad to God. I want to push back on any belief that we might hold either intentionally or unintentionally that if we are feeling deep grief, we need to isolate ourselves since our grief is too much for God or too much for others. We see in scripture that God's heart is for the brokenhearted, not against them. God's heart is for the orphan and the widow and the stranger. Instead, if anything smells bad to God, it is not grief, but a lack of compassion. It is not grief, but inauthentic religiosity. It is not grief, but it is saying that we follow him while forgetting those he loves. We see this in the prophets. The prophet Amos describes the words of the Lord in chapter 5, verse 21 through 24, saying this from the Lord, I hate, I despise your religious festivals, your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. Another moment of scripture where God speaks about the smells that he receives in Isaiah 65, all day long, the Lord says, I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations. And verse 5, who say, keep away, don't come near me, for I am too sacred for you. I am too holy for you. We may not say this in words, but do we ever say it in actions, where we see somebody who we feel like, oh, they might be too dangerous a person to draw near to or get to know. I am too sacred for you. Such people are a smoke in my nostrils, the Lord says, a fire that keeps burning all day. And finally, the Isaiah 1, we read this last week. Isaiah chapter 1, do not go on bringing your worthless offerings. Incense, that, that sweet-smelling incense that you 
you offer to me, well, that no is an abomination. New moon and Sabbath, the proclamation of an assembly. I cannot endure wrongdoing in the festival, the festive assembly. He says, they have become a burden to me. I am tired of bearing them. Instead, learn to do good. Seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Learn to do good. Seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Church family, this is week two of uh, our series called Practicing Faith. And I've shared with you that we're going to be doing series on practicing faith with different highlights or different focuses over the next several months and, and years. We're going to be doing these in, in phases and stages. And the, the value that we have as a church community that we are focusing on in this series, these three weeks, is this word serve together. We are called to serve the other, to follow the Jesus that said, I came not to be served, but to serve. Who said, whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. Who said, that religion in that the God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, to keep oneself being polluted from the world. What does it mean to serve? Last week we talked about serving vulnerable children. This week we've talked about or explored a story of a, a widow. So I have a question for us today. And I actually am going to invite you to, to raise your hand in answer to this. How many of us know or have been a widow or a widower? How many of us know someone who has lost a spouse? How many of us who have known someone who may have felt like Naomi? I went away Full, but I have come back empty. There are those among us who are experiencing this dark tunnel. Those who are God's dearly beloved. We don't currently have a specific widows or widowers ministry at this church, but I would like to explore it. If there are those of you who have a heart for this, who have a passion for this, please come talk to me. Let me know. I want to know how God is moving us forward to be faithful to this calling of Scripture. But there are some things that I'm going to invite us to do individually and some things I'm going to invite us to do corporately as a church. The first is, if you know anyone who is in this experience where they went away full but have come back empty, where they've lost a loved one, a widow, a widower. I'm going to invite you, if you are somebody who has lost someone recently, to maybe have a packet of sticky notes next to you. And any time a thought comes to mind in a way that somebody can practically help you, just write it down. Maybe you think to yourself, oh my word, I have to get my car fixed. Just write it down. Oh my word, I have to get some groceries today. Just write it down. And then, whenever you come across a friend who is going to say these words to you, they're going to say, how can I help? Pull out your sticky pad, pull the first one off the top, and hand it to them. Because I know that we as a community want to help and I know that there are people who need help, but sometimes it's hard to answer that question in the moment. If you are somebody, a friend or family member of somebody who has lost someone, be there. Maybe text, maybe send a handwritten letter. Suggest specific things that you can do rather than an open, a open-ended question like, how can I help? Maybe say, I would love to drop off some soup on Thursday. I don't have to come in. Can I do that? Or whatever. Invite them to things. Talk about, share memories about the person that has been lost. Most importantly, do what Ruth did and say, you are not alone. I am here to walk with you. 
There are specific things that we can do as individuals, and then there are things that we can do as a church for those who are experiencing this reality of I once was full, but now I'm empty. As I said before, if you want to be involved in providing some care for widows or widowers in particular, right now what we have are two different funds for that. We are currently, actually this coming week, working on raising money for a widow who has passed away who needs help with the funeral expenses. If you want to support that, you can notice in front of your pews, there's that little QR code, and you can give towards membership assistance. It will go towards that fund for the funeral for a widow who's passed away this past, um, in the last little while. We also have a compassion ministry fund for those outside of our church community who may need help. We also, today, as we mentioned, are expanding a ministry to a group that could say maybe they're not particularly widows or widowers, but they can definitely say, I once was full, but now I'm empty. I mentioned this in the beginning of our time together. This afternoon, we're doing a serve Sabbath to minister particularly to the homeless in our community. We're going to have additional ways for you to help support this ministry. If you're wanting to go today, connect with Pastor Stephen. Um, but there will be ways that you can help support throughout the month to care for those who say, I once was full, but now I'm empty. To respond to that tragic feeling by saying, we are here. God is with you. You are not alone. Put out your hands and let us fill them with all that God would give to you. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you that you are the one who walks beside us that our grief and our tears are seen by you and are precious to you. You do not turn away, God, but draw near to the brokenhearted. Instead, God, it is, it is indifference and a lack of compassion that angers you. So, God, we pray that we see those you would have us see, that our hearts break for those who your heart is broken for, that we reach out our hands and do what you have called us to do, to be your hands and feet in this world. God, show us the way. We pray this in your name. Amen.